Welcome to the Dance NYC 2022 Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies. We will be with you shortly. This year's symposium is focused on uncovering the generational continuum of lives and dance. Sessions explore career and life navigation, underscoring dance and artistic practice as core human needs, while building understanding across generations of audiences and dance workers. This multi-day event invites participants to investigate topics of mentorship, advocacy, leadership, and equity within an ethos of community care. We are so delighted to be in this community with you. Today's schedule. Earlier today, we experienced three equity sessions, one in racial justice, one in sanctuary space, and one in accessibility. Thank you to our facilitators. We also met with attorneys and consultants in one-on-one -on -one sessions through the Legal Clinic and Smart Bar. Thank you to all who joined us. Tonight's schedule begins with Dance NYC's opening remarks, followed by a DJ party hosted by Frank Malloy IV, also known as DJ Olobe. Accessibility. ASL interpretation and live captioning will be provided for today's session. A stream to text link will be posted in the chat and participation guide for access to the live transcription. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. Community Guidelines Based on Dance NYC's values of justice, equity, and inclusion, we agree to share our opinions, challenge perspectives, and engage or debate respectfully, and acknowledge and course correct if harm is caused. Honor everyone's personhood and humanity. Not tolerate speech that is disparaging, abusive, violent, or that is intended to defame someone's character publicly. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the Exhibitor Hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. We are happy to be in community with you. Thanks for joining. Welcome to the Dance NYC 2022 Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies. We will be with you shortly. This year's symposium is focused on uncovering the generational continuum of lives and dance. Sessions explore career and life navigation, underscoring dance and artistic practice as core human needs, while building understanding across generations of audiences and dance workers. This multi-day event invites participants to investigate topics of mentorship, advocacy, leadership, and equity within an ethos of community care. We are so delighted to be in this community with you. Today's schedule. Earlier today, we experienced three equity sessions, one in racial justice, one in sanctuary space, and one in accessibility. Thank you to our facilitators. We also met with attorneys and consultants in one-on-one -on -one sessions through the Legal Clinic and Smart Bar. Thank you to all who joined us. Tonight's schedule begins with Dance NYC's opening remarks, followed by a DJ party hosted by Frank Malloy IV, also known as DJ Olobe. Accessibility. ASL interpretation and live captioning will be provided for today's session. A stream to text link will be posted in the chat and participation guide for access to the live transcription. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. Community Guidelines. Based on Dance NYC's values of justice, equity, and inclusion, we agree to 
Share our opinions, challenge perspectives, and engage or debate respectfully, and acknowledge and course correct if harm is caused. Honor everyone's personhood and humanity. Not tolerate speech that is disparaging, abusive, violent, or that is intended to defame someone's character publicly. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions. Connect with other attendees. Join community conversations. Visit the Exhibitor Hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. We are happy to be in community with you. Thanks for joining. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm so glad you're here with us. Welcome to the Dance NYC 2022 Symposium. My name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, and I am the Executive Director of Dance NYC. My pronouns are she, her, and I identify as a non-disabled, white, Latina, cis woman, originally from Medellin, Colombia, the unceded territory of the Nutabes people, currently home to Embera Catillo, Chami, Dovida, Senu, Quechua, and Inga populations. I have been working and living in Lenape Hoki for 15 years now, and I am coming to you live from Dance NYC's offices in Gramercy, New York City. I am wearing a black and white scarf with a black shirt. My hair is brown and on my shoulders, a bold pink lipstick. My skin is fair, and behind me, an orange sign that reads New Yorkers for dance and a hot pink sign that reads artists are necessary workers. To those of you joining us on YouTube and on our magnificent Whova platform, welcome. Thank you for being here. I want to thank our ASL interpreters and our live captioners for their work with us tonight. Today, we kick off Dance NYC's third virtual symposium, a format we have gathered around since the arrival of COVID-19 to New York City two years ago. Over the course of these two years, we were reminded of the crucial role artists play in healthy local communities and how more than ever, as we reimagine our future together, artists are necessary workers. As the city enters spring and shifts into a more permanently reopening, we reflect on the losses we've experienced as a community, the ways we have adapted and grown, and the ongoing care we must continue to exercise as the impacts of the pandemic are still felt. With our offering to you today, we welcome the arrival of a new season and we roll up our sleeves as we iterate and adapt for what lies ahead. My name is Shani Jamila, and I'm so happy to join Alejandra in welcoming each of you to the 2022 Dance NYC Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Lenape or Delaware people, also known as New York City, where I've been a longtime resident. I'm an African-American woman wearing a fuchsia dress, gold and glass earrings, and a patterned headscarf. Behind me is a white wall of doors and two blue and purple posters from the Dance NYC archives. It's such a joy for us at, at Dance NYC to be able to create a moment for our community to assemble as artists, workers, educators, funders, and organizers who prioritize art making as essential and recognize its role in centering our humanity, especially in the challenging times Alejandra described. Indeed, artists are necessary workers. This is a truth that I know deep in my bones as I myself identify as a conceptual artist, cultural producer, and founder of the multi-platform storytelling project Lineage, which centers the voices of contemporary socially engaged Black artists. In my practice, 
I explore ideas of ancestry and identity formation in African-American and African diasporic communities. So it's really been my pleasure to think about how these generational continuums specifically impact the lives of dance workers in New York City while working on the curation and production of this symposium alongside a truly incredible team. Thank you all for joining us. I'm so looking forward to the magic that we will collectively co-create over the next few days that we'll share together. Today, on our opening day of the 2022 symposium, here's what you can expect. We'll start with a land and historical acknowledgement and then move into remarks from Parijat Desai, representing the symposium program committee. Following that, we'll talk a bit about this year's curatorial structure, thank our sponsors, and present Dance NYC's year in review. After a short break, we get to witness the incredible Karen Finley, Benedict Nguyen, and Carl Paris in a conversation that will, that will be moderated by Sarah Wilbur. Now, I would like to introduce River Whittle, who will lead our land acknowledgement. Um, my name is River Whittle. I am both white and Native American um, with fair skin. I have beaded earrings on, um, braids, and a black sweater. I am behind me is a white curtain in front of a window. Um, I use they them pronouns and I am coming to you uh, currently from Tewa territory, um, commonly known as Pueblo people. Um, there are 19 Pueblos all throughout the Southwest and I live mobily, but I'm currently here in their unceded territory. I'm very pleased to meet with all of you today. And I am an enrolled member of the Caddo Nation of Oklahoma. And I'm also a member of the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma. I only speak for my understanding of my people and do not represent my entire nation. My Delaware people are traditionally known as the Lenape. You all, as long as you're in New York City and the areas beyond, you occupy our homelands. Today, I'm going to offer you a small amount of information about my people and your responsibility to engage with us as settlers and or people living in our land. Uh, next slide, please. So this is Lenape territory. Our land is mostly in parts of what is currently known as Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Delaware. We no longer have the privilege of living permanently in our homelands as communities, as we were violently chased out due to genocidal and colonial practices at the hands of the United States government and various European settlers before that. Um, currently, we all exist in connection to these six communities that you'll see here. The Delaware tribe of Oklahoma, in what's known as the United States, the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma, also in the US, uh, the Stockbridge Muncie of Wisconsin, as well in the US, and in Canada, the Muncie Delaware Nation, the Moravian of the Thames First Nation, and the Delaware of Six Nations. So a lot of people will say that they're on Lenape and Canarsie land or Lenape and Wappinger land. But the way I was told is that all of these groups are Lenape. So this added lingo isn't needed. If you Google these nations, you can find their contact info and a lot of other historical information um, easily accessible. They and descendants of their communities should be the only people who are consulting on Lenape affairs. We have several groups of people pretending to be Lenape tribes that are not legitimate. 
uh, I mentioned this so that you all can know where to look to learn more and also so that you can avoid receiving false information. Next slide, please. So beyond a land acknowledgement, um, many of you may have heard a land acknowledgement um, where someone explains the land that they're occupying. But it's similar to someone getting in front of a crowd and saying, I acknowledge that I stole this car and then still driving off with the car. <laughs> um, we need the thing, aka our mother, our home, back. Even the American government prosecutes people for possessing something stolen. Why don't they apply their own rules when it regards Native people? It's the responsibility of settlers to return land to us, and it needs to happen sooner rather than later because Indigenous people protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. With our leadership, without our leadership, excuse me, climate change is going to take us and thousands of species of plants and animals down. I firmly believe in solidarity with other BIPOC um, people in our lands and beyond as well. And I believe that with each other, we are unstoppable. Um, next slide, please. So going forward, in order to start this work, you can reach out to the tribes that I mentioned. Um, you can educate yourself on Lenape history and issues. We have a very well-documented history, um, and there's a lot of historical books written about us. Um, you can also seek out Lenape voices to uplift and support. And I will leave you with a contact here. Um, this is the Cultural Preservation Office for my band of Lenape, the Delaware Nation. They do all types of programming and consults. And um, this information, as I mentioned, is easily accessible um, by researching any one of the six tribes that I mentioned. It does take work, but I believe it's necessary effort for all of our futures. Um, next slide, please. And if you have any further questions um, or you would like to look for other Lenape people to support, um, other artists or community workers, elders, um, women in our communities who are already doing really incredible work um, or would like to donate, you can reach out to my email here um, or my Instagram. My Instagram is Natana River, N A T A N E H R I V E R. Um, and I will be happy to share some resources for you. Um, so thank you, Manishi, for your time. Thank you, River. I'm grateful for the generosity with which you have shared with us about your work, your homeland, and its deep values and practices, and the many specific ways in which we must do better. As a collective of individual dance workers, artists, and organizers whose personal and artistic lives intersect at Dance NYC, we regularly practice land acknowledgments at meetings and public convenings. This includes taking actionable steps towards reparations in this initial instance by nurturing relationships with local indigenous and First Nations artists and organizations and making pathways for Lenape artists and leaders to return to Lenape hooking today. We recognize that as an organization based in New York City, we have benefited and continue to benefit from the systemic displacement and its intended and subsequent erasure of Lenape people and governance. Today, we are working to first ensure that we learn and research best practices for acknowledging and honoring the land we occupy. Second, intentionally invest time, resources, and energy in establishing and nurturing relationships with local Indigenous and First Nations artists and organizations and create opportunities for the many Indigenous artists living in New York City. And third, that we move beyond acknowledgement and into needed reparation and equity by supporting policies that ensure Lenape people can have their land back. Dance NYC must make concerted efforts to collaborate and make pathways 
for Lenape artists and leaders to return to Lenape hoking today. I want to provide some context for Dance NYC's regular practice of land acknowledgements at our meetings. This ongoing practice began with our own research and understanding of what land acknowledgements are, what they mean to us organizationally, and how, as settlers on this land, land acknowledgements help Dance NYC deepen our learning around this country's history of oppression, genocide, and continuous colonization of Indigenous and First Nations people. It was necessary for us to undergo this learning on our own first, with resources readily available to us, rather than placing the burden of that learning on Indigenous First Nations and American Indian people. The next step for us is moving our learning into a practice of relationship and investment to ensure the direct and vested involvement of Lenape Hoking leadership, of Indigenous artists, arts organizations, and advocates in Dance NYC's effort to honor the land and the histories of the land on which we work, host our events, and serve our constituents. This process is ongoing and iterative, for which there is no arrival point. Rather, it's a living, breathing relationship that requires learning, nurturing, practicing, adjusting, and repeating. Today, some of Dance NYC's com concrete commitments and actions include hosting of land acknowledgements and all of our internal and external convening, including staff and board meetings and town hall events, an annual payment of land acknowledgement fees to local indigenous organizations, mandatory and ongoing learning for our staff and board members, creation and updating of land acknowledgement resources on our website to connect Lenape artists to other organizations across the city, the hiring and inclusion of indigenous artists across Dance NYC's programs and activities, and a continual nurturing of relationships with Indigenous artists working here. Where we are in our learning today would not have been possible without the support and leadership of Emily Johnson. Emily, I know you're in the middle of travels, but I just wanted to thank you not just for your generosity and your friendship, but for your ongoing activism and organizing in support of Indigenous, First Nations and American Indian peoples across Turtle Island in arts and culture. We recognize that what we have learned is not ours to keep, but it is also not ours to teach or benefit financially from. For this reason, as River noted earlier, we encourage colleague organizations and groups to work directly with Lenape, Indigenous artists, and First Nation artists and activists to address the way settler colonialism manifests in your work and organizations. Hire and pay Indigenous artists. Fantastic, and thank you all for bearing with us as we negotiate and navigate technology. Um, I'd like to say thank you, Alejandra. In years prior, Dance NYC has included site-specific historical acknowledgements as part of its indigenous land acknowledgement. However, based on our learning, we feel that these are two different components of our practice of recognition. So we wanted to honor them as separate but related moments. The focal points of Dance NYC's historical acknowledgement practice are as follows. One, the African slave trade. Two, migration and immigration patterns. Three, the disability rights and disability justice movements. And four, the LGBTQ plus fight for justice. As Alejandra and I share a bit of background on each of these sections, on your screen will appear a series of slides with white text on a blue background, featuring an assortment of icons. These slides simply provide the text for what we're reading aloud. We would like to acknowledge um, 
the African slave trade, the enslaved workers, freedom fighters, and cultural leaders of African ancestry who were forcibly brought to what is now known as New York City. During the colonial period, 41% of the city's households had enslaved Africans. Only Charleston, South Carolina rivaled New York in the extent to which slavery penetrated everyday life. Enslaved Africans built the roads, the docks, the wall that gives Wall Street its name, as well as most of the important buildings of the early city. We also celebrate their legacy through the free Black societies of Seneca Village, the Week and Weeksville, through the cultural epicenters of Harlem, Brooklyn, and the South Bronx, and we honor their spirits at the African Burial Ground National Monument. We also acknowledge and mourn all Black people whose lives have been violently harmed and or taken by the actions of white people, institutions and systems, and the many accomplices, witnesses, and beneficiaries of white supremacy who have either actively participated or stood by and observed in silence. We recognize the many populous immigrant communities from Eastern Europe, Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean, and how they have shaped the New York City that we know and love. These groups have too often endured living through harsh conditions, low wages, continuous displacement, and racial and ethnic discrimination, and continue to be plagued by persecution and lack of access to basic needs while undertaking the essential labor of this town. We honor their contributions to the diversity and cosmopolitan culture that this city now celebrates. We also want to acknowledge the uptick in violence that has been occurring against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, many of whom are immigrants. We remain firmly in support of the well being and safety of our Asian American and Pacific Islander dance colleagues and continue to champion the role the dance can play to foster the inclusion and integration of human rights in the New York City metropolitan area. As a part of our ongoing commitment to foster equity in dance and culture, we seek to also dismantle ableism and apply and amplify, excuse me, the voices and autonomy of disabled people through our advocacy, action-oriented research and regranting programs. At this time, I wanna honor the history behind one of Dance NYC's guiding principles, Nothing Without Us. Nothing Without Us is a slogan that comes from the disability rights movement and was popularized in the 1990s by disability activist, James Charleston, through its use by South African disability activists, Michael Masutha and William Rowland. The term stems from nothing about us without us, which communicates that no policy or practice should be created without the direct investment of the affected group. The community knows the needs of its people best, so they need to steer the ship. Disability activist Lawrence Cardo Long repositioned the phrase with the shorter nothing without us which we have since adopted as an organizational value through the establishment of our Disability Dance Artistry Task Force and initiative, and informs all aspects of our work in all program areas. One aspect of disability justice is accessibility. Accessibility today is a core component of our programming and planning ensuring accessible routes and facilities incorporating interpretation braille or closed captioning, and the centering of the work, the scholarship, artistry, and direction of disabled artists is a critical component of each year's in-person event. These priorities have carried over in turning today's gathering into a digital event. We have ASL interpretation from Sign Nexus and open closed captioning from the Viscardi Center which we have pinned, designed into the, con into the broadcast that you are experiencing. If any images are used, they will be described orally. Throughout the symposium, we will feature several videos from production collaborators and that information with written descriptions on every video can be found in our participation guide, located in the resources section on the Whova platform and shared in the chat during their broadcasts. 
On Friday, March 18th, our keynote address and remarks will include live audio description provided by David Linton. The conference call number and access code to access the live audio description will also be broadcast and it will be included in the participation guide. New York City's fast pace and glorification of ableist and oppressive values must be opposed at every turn as we understand ableist practices are deeply rooted in eugenics, colonialism, and capitalism. We recognize that this includes but is not limited to access to independent and safe transportation, employment, and health care for disabled people. Lastly, we would also like to acknowledge the LGBTQ fight for justice in New York City. The Stonewall Inn declared a national monument in recognition of the June 1969 uprising there, anchors NYC at the heart of that movement, which propelled the formation of other gay, lesbian, and bisexual civil rights organizations. Notably, within 20 years of the Stonewall Rebellion, hundreds of protesters would take to our city streets for a die-in demonstrations organized by the AIDS Coalition to unleash power or act up. By early 1987, the U.S. death toll was over 40,000 people, a loss that was particularly felt in this city's dance community. And worldwide, HIV infections reached 5 to 10 million, which is not too dissimilar to the death toll statistics we are still facing with the global, co with the global COVID-19 pandemic. Let's learn from the lessons we were taught during the AIDS epidemic as we continue to persevere through this era. Moreover, we urge you to consider the ways in which the coronavirus is an intersectional issue and will continue to have a devastatingly disproportionate effect on marginalized communities around the world. Thank you. We encourage you to participate in this historical acknowledgement with us by also considering the history of the local land that you occupy and what reparations you can begin to make today. Thank you, Shani. And thank you all everyone for joining us for these acknowledgements. This week's event and all of the experiences and opportunities we have prepared for you would not have been possible without the support of our funders and donors. We are committed to ensuring our programs are free or low cost and work with our partners in philanthropy to ensure that that remains true. Tonight, we'd like to extend our thanks to our lead funders for the symposium, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We would also like to thank our ongoing philanthropic partners and individual donors who support Dance NYC's general operations, like the Mertz Gilmore Foundation, where our offices are, the Harkness Foundation for Dance, and the Sherman Foundation, just to name a few, for allowing us to not only offer these programs, but to pay our workers living, dignified wages and benefits while doing so. We thank Con Edison, who is Dance NYC's 2022 Symposium Lead Corporate Sponsor, and the incomparable Jody Gottfried Arnhold, who is Dance NYC's 2022 Symposium Lead Dance Advocate. Subsidies for the student and dance worker ticketeers were also made possible by the Arnhold Foundation. A special thanks to our Leader Plus and Leader Level sponsors, 92Y Harkness Dance Center, the Dance Education Laboratory, Cataliotti Law PC, and Full Out Creative. A big thank you to Give Me, our host level sponsor, Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance, Dance NYC's official Dance Break sponsor, and all our partner level sponsors, the Actors Fund, Ballet Hispanico, Fit for Dance, Naimi Chen Dance Company, NDI Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, New York Live Arts, The Joyce, and Tom O'Connor Consulting Group. We also would like to thank our many nonprofit and educational exhibitors and our justice, equity, and inclusion partners. I'd also like to thank our production collaborators for bringing the symposium to life, including Fool Out Creative, Hunter College Dance Department, 
the Clark Center, and 92Y Harkness Dance Center. Before I move on with today's program and you learn about the heart and soul of everything that we've prepared for you, I want to take a moment to thank and recognize the incredible curatorial and organizing effort of Dance NYC's Senior Manager of Programming and Justice Initiatives, Candace Thompson Zachary. Candace, who joined the Dance NYC team in 2019 at the heart of the at the height of the preparations for the 2020 symposium before she knew a global pandemic was about to descend upon us. Um, she's been working tirelessly alongside an incredible team of folks, including guest curators X and George Emilio Sanchez, whom you will hear from momentarily, the symposium programming committee and the Dance and NYC staff. Our program's coordinator is Idao, symposium coordinator Brinda Guha, and the newest member of our team, who you've already had the pleasure to meet tonight, Interim Programs Manager, Shani Jamila. Thanks, Ale. On behalf of the programming crew, we'd like to acknowledge the full team at Dance NYC, who have all been so generous in giving their time and expertise to the realization of this event. And I also want to give a special shout out to Brenda and Izzy, both of whom are incredible colleagues and have been a true joy to work with. I'm so grateful for their commitment and laughter and rigor. Of course, none of this would be possible, as you mentioned, without the gargantuan effort and vision of Candace Thompson Zachary. You won't be seeing much of Candace tonight because as she worked to create this weekend's program, she was also very busy welcoming a new addition to her family. Please join us in congratulating Candace and her amazing husband, Andre Zachary, on the recent arrival of their first child. Congratulations, Candace. And Congratulations. <laughs> and here's the happy family. Yay. <laughs> oh, beautiful. With that, I'd like to welcome Parijat Desai to offer remarks as a member of the Symposium Programming Committee. Good evening and welcome. My name is Parijat Desai and I'm a member of the Symposium Programming Committee. I'm a dance maker, teacher and artistic director of Parijata Dance Company and I'm signing on from Muncie Lenape territory uptown. My pronouns are she, her and I identify as a non-disabled, cisgender, queer, caste privileged South Asian woman. I have brown skin, black hair, and I'm in my apartment. It's been an honor to serve on the committee these past two years, uh, to brainstorm with the other members and to witness the creative act of birthing this gathering, led so deftly by Candace Thompson Zachary. In developing themes for the symposium during the second year of the pandemic, we considered broad-based moves toward care and interdependence in both artistic and social justice movements. They emerge in necessary response to economic inequity, disregard for health in favor of profit and productivity, and persistent racial injustice and hate. And here I want to pause um, to acknowledge the recent brutal attack on a Filipina elder in Yonkers. To send our prayers to her and her family and to gently call on us to continue developing a coalition mindset. As a committee, uh, we wanted to align with movements toward care and interdependence, exploring those themes in our field, specifically to call attention to intergenerational interdependence and care of the whole artist. And so our theme, life cycles, livelihoods, and legacies. 
life cycles. Um, we asked, what does it mean to support the whole dance artist, um, including when dancing with disability? What does it mean to live a life in dance spanning youth to old age? And so our offerings attempt to address facets of that journey. Uh, livelihoods, we asked, how do we address the needs of the working artist, including those of different generations? So you'll find uh, various panels, including one on growing a dance business. Um, and one of my favorite titles, the title in particular, uh, Digital Marketing for Career Longevity, which to me is basically saying, uh, you know, come on, you got to step up to the gram, 50 plus people, or otherwise, you know, you don't exist. Um, and finally, legacies. We, here we considered uh, preservation of all artistic uh, legacies. So we have, for example, a panel on how to build an archive of your own work. Um, and perhaps most important, we wanted to foster dialogue between um, artists of different generations um, to share about their experiences, ideas, and practices. Our upcoming keynote invites artists to talk about their experiences uh, with two historically charged and evolving culture debates. In the coming conversations, as artists, thinker, activists of various generations interact, I'm curious to see where missing links appear and how connections develop. Our committee's hope is that through this sharing, we better resource each other and the field. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am calling in from Muncie Lenape and Wappinger Territories. My name is X, my pronouns are they, Z, Fay, and I am a transdisciplinary artist. I am humbled to also say that I'm one of the guest curators for this year's symposium. Something I have thought about recently is that the average lifespan of an adult butterfly is approximately two weeks. As a dance artist in my late 20s, each day I rehearse, audition, perform, I feel like a butterfly, beautiful and transformed, yet yeah, with just weeks to live. As a dance artist with widespread hypermobility, prone to frequent muscle spasms and acute injury, I fear that the masochistic thrill of pushing my body beyond its limits is more likely to shorten my career rather than lengthen it. This year's Dance NYC Symposium, Life Cycles, Livelihood, Legacy, is comprised of thoughtfully curated workshops and discussions that intend to educate, reassure, and inspire. The experiences of our influential speakers span across generations, performance disciplines, disabilities, abilities, and approaches. To exist in the field of dance and performance is to constantly feel like an endangered species. And for those of us living in historically marginalized bodies and identities, endangerment may feel inevitable, threatening us from all sides. Scary, right? If you find yourself sweaty right now, I want you to take a deep breath. And recognize that you're in the right place. Come for the answers stay for the revelations. 
Hello, this is uh, George Emmanuel Sanchez. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the ancestral homelands of Lenape Hoking, Muncie, Lenape and Canarsie people. I just wanted to give a quick hello and a welcome. I unfortunately cannot be present uh, due to my own uh, performances later this evening, but um, I just wanted to share with everyone that um, I am very thankful and appreciative of what Dance NYC is doing in all its different configurations. But I really think the symposium is an incredible opportunity to bring all these amazing people together from all these beautiful backgrounds and abilities. And um, uh, I was very lucky to be a part of the team this year. And uh, my thanks go to everyone affiliated with Dance NYC, with my co-curator, with X, um, and uh, a special shout out to everybody on the team, but especially to Candace, who I uh, worked with a lot and highly respect and felt very blessed to be working with her. Um, but I hope people will take advantage of this amazing opportunity that we're very fortunate to be able to do here. Um, also, as a, as a forum by which all of us can uh, collectively come together to exchange so many stories and narratives and experiences that eventually will have, I think, great impact on um, dance making and performance work in New York City and beyond. And um, the, the theme this year speaks to so many people, so many generations, and um, I just want to commend Dance NYC for doing this. I want to thank all of you for participating. And I look forward that our path will cross sometime in the future. And forgive me for not being there physically, but I'm definitely with everyone in spirit. So thank you. This year's theme, Life Cycles, Livelihoods, Legacies, really speaks to the importance of building bridges around intergenerational perspectives. This is a subject that is particularly relevant two years into the pandemic, given all of the upheavals and transitions that the dance community and wider world have had to experience. What lessons can our community apply from our collective survival that can be of service to us now? How did past generations move through their eras of tumult? This symposium is designed to create space for us to have open conversations about our experiences as people first, with family lives, financial obligations, and emotional needs, while also thinking about the inheritances that we're shaping as artists. Further, this idea of crafting a way forward in the face of instability which is already so inherent in dance workers' lives, felt necessary as a focus for the 2022 symposium. We are calling forth the world where dance workers experience strong reciprocal relationships across generations and are supported in navigating various life cycles and career challenges. Their livelihood, sustainability, and rest are ensured through dignified wages, and they are empowered and equipped to lead change within their communities. In addition to a full slate of lectures and panels, the 2022 symposium includes equity workshops to ground us collectively in thinking about how race, immigration, and our approaches to accessibility inform our work. A daily welcome and wake up where we can gather digitally to greet each other before going to our respective sessions. A daily dance break by leading artists in the field, sponsored by the Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance. This is an opportunity for us all to align our bodies and minds and hearts through movement. A daily debrief led by experienced dance artist facilitators, where we can connect as a group, compare notes, and reflect on how to incorporate the things we've learned into our practices. A virtual expo showcase featuring lives, live sessions in the exhibitor hall by our sponsors. This is an opportunity for you to expand your relationships with various organizations that serve and operate in the dance field. Visit their booths, attend their live informational sessions, and check out their promotional offers and discounts. 
The virtual booths are a symposium within a symposium. We invite you to be present in whatever way feels possible for you and to soak up as much as you can. Thank you for joining us for this special occasion and for going on this experimental virtual symposium journey with us. We look forward to your feedback and reflections as we continue to serve you with this convening and are equally excited to broach new conversations, hopefully in person, in the years to come. Thank you so much, Shani. And really to the work that the committees and all of the folks that have imagined and put together this offering for us, um, for all the work that you've done. It's really with that spirit of inquiry that Shani was talking about, that as an organization, we, her we hope to serve you during this event and throughout this year, a big year for us. It's our 10th year operating as an independent nonprofit. We were planted as a seed just over 20 years ago as a program of Dance USA and then later emerged as an independent nonprofit and have now been with you all for 10 years. Dance NYC has remained in that time committed to promoting the knowledge, appreciation, practice and performance of dance in the metropolitan New York City area. And we hope to continue to advocate for a more just, equitable and inclusive ecology for dance workers, organizations, groups, and businesses. In um, the winter of 2021, we shared a state of the organization address um, where we um, conveyed our desire as an organization and collective of workers to dive deeply into a spirit of learning, of reflection, and um, of returning to more intimate and interdependent community relationships. To honor this intention, over the past three months, we focused our efforts on establishing stronger internal systems, um, completing some key grant-making initiatives that we uh, started in 2021, and to build strong legislative relationships to better advocate for the dance sector. Some of the highlights of our activity over the past three months include the launching of a staff wellness program to provide mental health services and coaching to the Dance NYC team to supplement the demands of increased social justice work. We also began offering free financial coaching via Trust Plus, which allows our staff um, to personally address their budgets, their management of debt, and prepare for their financial futures. We were able to do this with thanks to the generosity of the Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund. We also welcomed new staff members and promoted existing employees to expand capacity as we continue to meet the sector's pressing needs. We invite you to check out um, our new team members, go on our website, read their bios, and learn about who they are. We continue to advocate for dance workers by signing on to eight legislative letters, we offered four testimonies to different government bodies, and we ensured that as a sector, we remained up to date with shifting COVID-19 mandates through our reopening dance in New York City toolkit. We announced the grantees of the Dance Advancement Fund. We continued the application phase of the New York City Dance Rehearsal Space Subsidy Program, and we completed the Disability Dance Artistry Residency Program. In addition, with the support of a coalition of nine philanthropic partners, we were able to distribute another round of relief support to 150 dance-making organizations to support their reopening efforts. Additionally, we launched a new Coronavirus Dance Relief Fund, the New York State Edition, in partnership with NISCA to deliver much needed financial support to individual dance makers and organizations across New York State. As we look to the rest of 2022, we have three main goals as an organization. First, to launch a new initiative focused on economic justice for the dance sector, whose anchor activity is to hear from you. Second, to begin a strategic planning period in order to reflect on our work as an organization 
and prepare for the years ahead. And last but certainly not least, rest. Beyond answers, what we hold are questions and an audacious vision for the future. What is the role of art, of dance, in honoring our collective humanity? How do the stories we tell on and off the stage truthfully reflect history and the people we are? What do systems of collective care look like? How do we continue to intentionally address the harms caused by white supremacy and contribute to a liberated future for every member of the dance community? How do we, Dance NYC, remain adaptive, accountable, and transparent in our relationships to you about our power, resources, and capacity? Who are we best positioned to serve? And finally, how can we nurture an ecosystem that allows each of us to make dance with dignity? That's right, to make dance with dignity, to thrive, to dance. That is our desire and what we are collectively working towards. We're now going to take a moment um, to reflect on some of the things that we've shared to take a, a, a short bio break and we will resume right after with our opening keynote conversation, art making and humanity, interrogating attitudes on culture, race and politics across decades. We'll be right with you.
Thank you all for rejoining us. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's opening keynote, Art Making in Humanity, Interrogating Attitudes on Culture, Race, and Politics Across Decades, featuring Karen Finley, Arts Professor in the Department of Art and Public Policy at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, Benedict Nguyen, freelance dancer, writer, and creative producer, and Dr. Carl Paris, scholar and professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Montclair State University. This conversation will last approximately 90 minutes and will be moderated by Dr. Sarah Wilbur, assistant, assistant professor and director of graduate studies at Duke University's dance program. We hope that you will also help keep the conversations going. Tag Dance NYC on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and use the hashtag Dance Simp. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for that introduction. My name is Sarah Wilbur, and I am a non-disabled, light-skinned cis female in her late 40s. Um, I have brown chin-length hair. I'm wearing a green shirt. I'm sitting in a green room. It's painted green. And I'm at my home office surrounded by a lot of green trees um, on land that's stewarded by the Catawba, Shikori, Tuscarora, and Eno peoples, also known as Durham, North Carolina. Um, I'm happy to be moderating today's event. And when we all first met the panelists and I um, across the Zoom screen to prepare for tonight's conversation, we discussed the curatorial framing of this event as a kind of cross-generational call to think about the so-called culture wars period and the rise of multiculturalism as historical launch points that have lessons to teach us today about enduring issues such as censorship, arts labor, arts labor advocacy, and the historically uneven distribution of resources in the U.S. dance field. So to sh share with you how I enter this conversation, I am a longstanding uh, choreographer and dance grant seeker, and I entered the dance field in 1996 uh, in my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And 1996 was a moment of a huge sea change, kind of the tail end of these culture wars that our curators have asked us to consider. If you fast forward to today, 26 years later, I am now a scholar at Duke University and I research teach and write about labor and how institutional policies impact the ways that artists organize and perform their work. Um, just this past fall, I um, published a book called Funding Bodies, and it tracks the history and influence of the National Endowment for the Arts on generations of dance makers. So for anyone, uh, just for some framing, for anyone um, unfamiliar with the National Endowment for the Arts or the NEA, um, this is a citizen-run independent agency that was established in 1965, and it is the lone arts funding body that is nested in the executive branch of the U.S. federal government. So historians who have addressed this period called the quote-unquote culture wars are generally describing a period that comes into prominence around the Reagan administration around 1980, uh, through 1996, and it's a period characterized by heightened economic contingencies that were really threatening public arts support and publicly funded artists. These are things like federal budgetary flatlines um, and, and increased cuts to funding under the Reagan and Clinton administrations. These cuts were compounded by heightened governmental oversight, by which I mean that dance grantees in this period, we're confronting heightened administrative accounting pressures and also pressures to assimilate to new rules and regulations in order to be eligible for dance support. So inside of the NEA, as I've studied it, um, staff and citizen grant panelists were grappling during this time with calls for greater distributional equity 
as a growing number of applicants were coming to the agency for funding. Meanwhile, there were budgetary shortfalls and any artists who won support were required to sign decency clauses as a stipulation of arts support. So a lot of historical attention has been paid to this period and to these very public manifestations of institutional censorship. These are instances where NEA grantees refused to comply with these regulations and saw their support rescinded. These um, examples consumed the media and certain artists were brave enough to name and amplify demands for accountability by the NEA and they saw their concerns uh, travel all the way to the Supreme Court. So in my study of this period, just by way of framing, I look at the culture wars, but I actually look at it from another angle, spotlighting less visible, less public efforts to address funding inequities that were happening at the same time behind closed doors in dance. So at the NEA, beneath the smoke of these controversies, I study how short-lived programs like the 1993 Vernacular Dance Preservation Initiative drew unanticipated interest among social dance makers who had been historically under endowed um, and this program had only one instantiation. So I'm just pointing to these kinds of examples as historical blueprints that were ultimately lost during the NEA's battles and during the 39% budget cut and agency wide restructuring that befell the agency around 1996 at the hands of the 104th Congress. So I'm playing historian with you all now just to point to these historical instances of both overt and covert censorship and overt and covert controversies because we on this panel agree that these historical examples can help inform current debates on how to achieve distributional equity and uh, repair wealth distribution in dance. So today, some of the legacies of activism and censorship that we hope to surface hope to demonstrate how across generations artists remain fiercely committed workers who make ongoing demands on the systems that they inherit including the systems that try to hold them down so it is my hope that those of us assembled today can take inspiration from what artist curator kimberly camp decried back in 1996 as the quote unquote brand of censorship called racism also alive in the 80s and 90s as one of many de facto policies that artists and funding bodies struggle with today, however, indirectly. So again, when we met over Zoom, the panelists and I agreed that my opening remarks here would then be followed by introductions from each panelist who will each speak to how they enter this particular conversation. After the introductions, I'm gonna pose some questions to the group and as a group, we remain grateful to Candace, George, X, and the planning committee and the amazing Dance NYC team for this chance to be with you today for this exchange. Um, we thank everyone also who's joined us in the live stream um, today as well. So we're gonna now hear from Karen, Benedict, and Carl in that order. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's really a wonderful experience to be here. I'm just getting my view here. <laughs> um, so, hello. Uh, like I said, I'm Karen Finley, and thank you for such an amazing introduction. And to everyone here, um, for me and the opportunity that I can be here with you today. I am visiting right now, I'm not, I'm not at my home, but I am visiting the city of Ann Arbor, Michigan that occupies the ancestral, traditional and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe. And I identify as a privileged white cis female and I'm wearing a floral jacket with pink and yellow flowers with dark blue background. And my pronoun is she, hers, they, them. And I have reddish brown hair that's long below my shoulders. And I am in a blurred hotel room and I'm sure many of you know what those blurred hotel rooms are like. And uh, I want to again, thank Dance New York City and the administrators and to also thank our moderator for putting this together. 
uh, with the questions, and also to Benedict and Carl, my co-panelists here. Now, a little bit about me um, is it's my pleasure and joy to be here. And my opening remarks is just basically as I would requested of me to tell you a little bit of how I enter the conversation. I am an artist, a performer, and I work interdiscipline as an in, uh, interdisciplinary way. So I work, create installations. I also create walks. I do, and a lot of my work usually always involves politics um, or some type of social um, issue that my work addresses. And my early performance work too involved the body and about gender issues and many of the things that I said or using my body caused me censorship issues, which is very, talking about this uh, is a struggle for me. And I wanted to say that it, this is an emotional issue for me. And so I wanted to tell everyone that sometimes if my words or the way that I'm talking is not always clear is because it's still an emotional issue for me from those times of what I what I went through with the censorship issues. I work in education and I love working in education. And, and I think I was introduced at NYU. And I also give workshops widely. And I'm here today because George Emilio Sanchez invited me to. And he, uh, he I just also want to say that he just did an incredible um, show that's still on the Court of the Conquistador. And I suggest that everyone who can produce or bring that show to your institution, do it now or try to go and see it. Um, I was a name plaintiff of with three other artists in, in because our uh, grants were denied uh, from the National Endowment for the Arts in 1990. And the other three other plaintiffs were Holly Hughes, John Fleck, and Tim Miller. And they deemed our, that the reason why our grants were denied to us was because of decency. But at that time, and this then becomes, I think for the purpose here right now, I'm not going to go into all of the diff different issues, but it led to us having uh, the, the, the case eventually went to the Supreme Court. And there's many other relationships to the idea of decency and public funding that can be related to reading, to health care, and even related to abortion, or reproductive rights, or uh, um, in terms of the sense of thinking about decency and, uh, and, and support. Um, since then, I've really rarely have been funded or supported in, 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 in that way, but I have, and that's what I'm going to, I am grateful to all the support I have received from the communities to the audience, the friends, families, and strangers. I have been supported. I feel supported um, creating and feeling joy despite being denied by certain institutions or authorities. And that to me is my resilience and what I feel that I can offer with my creativity of for us to consider all different ways of support in the voices and uh, in education and the many opportunities that I can also create too. And I think it's important to be thinking about other ways of funding in terms of which I say with institutions, for example, Philip Morris, which was so strong in terms of supporting dance and I actually once boycotted uh, the Bessies Award because of that funding and their relationship with Jesse Helms. And um, I still remember that that was really divisive within um, the dance community at that time when I took taking this stand. Um, so, so I would like to add here that I'm thinking about small gestures in the world that make uh, that make the world better, and. Um, how in this world today, with the war, in the invasion, random violence, and with the police violence, with the, coming out of the pandemic, with Black Lives Matter, with the sexism, and also that when we're saying with Asian violence, so much of the violence that is surrounding us, art within mental health, homeless advocacy, 
But I do feel that dance movement, performance movement for me is instrumental to vitality and to, and to life. And even that it is like breath, the movement and the joy de voix to living. And so that can be a contribution that I wanted to just be saying in terms of small gestures that make the world better. And uh, I want to just, so I think I will just leave that he, there, but um, I, I am really grateful for this opportunity to be here. And I hope that I can be helpful with my experiences. Thank you. That was it. Karen, thank you. This is Sarah. I'm going to kick it to Benedict for an introduction. Thank you, Sarah and Karen and Dance NYC. Good evening, everyone. Happy Pisces season. My name is Benedict Wheaton. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Yes to Pisces season. Um, I'm a light, tan-skinned Vietnamese person with long, wavy black hair. I am wearing... Um, what am I wearing? I'm wearing a black and reddish color block top with flowers on it as well. Um, pink eyeshadow. I'm like looking at myself in the camera. Red lipstick and gold earrings. Um, I'm approaching this conversation as I'll introduce myself as a freelancer first and foremost. I've worked in the fields in many different capacities. Um, just today, I had a meeting with an artist that I work with as a creative producer and an external partner. I had a job interview. I am here at this talk. Um, and then I have a bartending shift right after this ends. So uh, I also come to this panel, I think, as the token millennial, which I joked about on our prep call <laughs> a couple weeks ago. Um, so I think about all of the hats that I've worn in the field over the years, not as um, particularly unique, nor is this kind of hyperbolically obscenely long day that I'm having unique to me, but rather it's something that's pretty characteristic of how artists of my generation have had to figure it out to make work. Um, I'm broadcasting to y'all from the land of the Lot Bay people. I'm in Manhattan right now, but I live in the South Bronx, the unceded land of Lenape Bay and Wappinger peoples. Um, and yeah, I've been based in New York since 2015. I've worked as a dancer, freelancing with um, a number of different choreographers and in different projects in different settings over the years. I've also worked as an administrator, helping um, choreographers um, that I will call affectionately boomers um, who came up in the fields in the late 80s and 90s and started nonprofit organizations to support their work as the company model was sort of dying, so to, so to speak. Um, and I've, in that capacity, I've written grants, I've managed payroll, I've produced shows and done marketing. Um, and I feel like millennials in the crowd are like, yes, we know how to do all of those things. Um, I also come to this conversation as a writer and researcher about the field. So most of my interest in my freelance writing has been about the conditions that allow artists to make work, those conditions being um, economic, those conditions being how a space for making is created and taken care of. And I've written about my own experience in rehearsal processes, as well as reported on other makers in the field. I profiled artists and how they approach their creative processes. Um, and most recently, uh, I've been shifting um, my work as a curator, um, where I founded the platform Soft Bodies in Hard Places um, and am starting a consultancy with longtime collaborator Stephanie George, the Nerve Studio, where we're working with artists to figure out how to make work as the economy evolves. Thank you. 
This is Sarah. Thank you, Benedict. I'm going to kick it over to Carl for an introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, really excited to be here. Um, uh, let's see. I go by the pronouns he, him, his, and um, I currently live on uh, the ancestral land of the Lenape uh, called uh, Manahata. I'm a proud black male who wears uh, dreadlocks that extend below uh, my shoulder blades, um, my clavicles, I should say. And um, I'm a reasonably pleasant person to look at, I like to tell myself, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's my opinion. And uh, my screen background is partially of my bookcase, which is kind of always in a state of uh, disarray, but I kind of like it like that. Um, and I'm delighted to participate uh, in this panel. And, and I think that uh, at least one good thing that the COVID pandemic has done uh, for us is to force us to find new ways of uh, presenting and talking about dance. Though I remain concerned, uh, of course, about many aspects of uh, dance these days, I found inspiration uh, in so much of what uh, folks have done across all genres of dance in the past few years. So I come to this panel as one who has danced with Olatunji, African dance, and Elio Palmieri, Martha Graham, and uh, Alvin Ailey, modern dance companies from the late 1960s into the 1980s. I taught dance and choreographed in Spain for 15 years. And for some time now, I have been dedicated to the scholarly project of dance studies and culture with particular emphasis on black dance and performance. For me today, today's agenda and this incredibly diverse panel has both revived old questions and sparked new ones around what multiculturalism might actually mean, including its purported advantages and disadvantages, uh, what cultural wars might mean, and how does or does or how has or how or does that drive opportunity? censorship and funding across governmental, cultural, and intracultural systems. And finally, what all of this might mean in terms of gender and sexuality representation. Uh, I'm, I guess if Benedict considers himself the token uh, millennial, I'm the token OG, I guess. Uh, who um, goes across various uh, decades of having been a dancer and dance teacher and also choreographer and now a scholar. And I'm deeply uh, interested in two, two aspects of dance, more actually, but uh, as it pertains to this panel, I'm really interested on the one hand, uh, as many of you said, the meaning of dance, the, the essential essence of how dance makes meaning in culture and represents culture and, and, and provides such uh, nutrition for our thinking and practice across humanity as well as art and so forth. Um, more specifically, I'm interested these days in issues of representation around black dance and specifically on the black male body. Uh, actually, I'm working on some uh, projects focused on the semiotics of the black male body in connection with how we see the black male body in culture and how that might or might not translate into our spectatorship of the black male body in modern dance. 
So these are the, those are a couple of things that I'm interested in presently, and I'm really excited to hear what uh, people have to say about um, the topics that we've uh, gathered around today. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, Carl. This is Sarah again. And in the time we have remaining, there's so many places that we could start. But um, since uh, Carl was just mentioning nutrition, being fed, being sustained, what does this, I thought maybe we could open with a question about support and infrastructure. So that word infrastructure is often thrown around as uh, the hidden systems of support that make dance happen, right? That make art possible. Um, and also infrastructure is something people talk about, generally speaking, when it breaks down. So we're talking a little bit today about breakdowns and I'm just wondering, I'd love to hear each of you talk about support systems, whether they're breakdowns that you've experienced um, in moments of cultural or economic crises such that we've um, surfaced already. So the 2008 economic crisis is one that millennial artists inherit, um, and that's a certain kind of shock, an economic shock to the system. Um, and I'd love to hear anyone who wants to start speak to infrastructure, if we could. Should we go in reverse order? Should we start with you, Carl? Okay. Um, yeah, as you say, uh, there are lots of ways to enter into even just that specific question. But I'm thinking about like my beginnings of a, as a dancer. Um, and, and one thing that I'm, I'm thinking about and I have been thinking about in, in the days leading up to this is how I started um, with El the Elio Palmieri Dance Company with Dance Mobile. Uh, so it was one of those um, developments or, or in infrastructure and in funding that helped get, uh, shall we say, dance by African Americans that was emerging in the late 60s and 70s to really get a foothold into the concert art dance, uh, artist dance, um, dance as art making. And it helped sustain uh, people like Elio Palmieri, but also provided uh, a sort of an income, a modest income uh, for young dancers like me who were just coming into the field. And it also extended into the arts and eds programs. We performed a lot in, in, in um, uh, 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 secondary schools and, and primary schools and all of that. An extraordinary experience. Some of that has stayed around. It seems that some of it has not stayed around so well. And so in answer to your question, those are some of the things that first come to my attention. I'm also thinking about how the ideas of multiculturalism um, have, have kind of bumped up against that later on. But I think I, maybe I should, I, I, I think I should, I would like to hold off on that till we, kind of get more specifically to that um, that uh, subject and uh, see what others think. Beautiful, Carl, thank you. Can, can we hear from Benedict? Uh, sure, hi, this is Benedict. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I feel like um, artists of my generation entered the economy at a point where I'm not an economist, so forgive this really intentionally reductive summary, but like how the last however many decades of rising inflation and wage stagnation have just trickled into how we structure our lives. The number of jobs that we have to hold on to at the same time to make rent um, while, um, and it, I, I culturally, I've thought a lot about how that trickles into how rehearsals are, structure, are structured, how people can invest into a creative process or creative relationship. Um, when the choreographer or director of a process is also kind of scrambling to apply for grants and probably working a job in academia or elsewhere, 
and their kind of capacities are lowered. Um, I've thought about my capacity to be, you know, attentive, generous, present in rehearsals when I'm like coming in off of barely any sleep and in between shifts. Um, and yeah, I don't mean the, I, my intention isn't at all to, you know, request a pity party, but I think this is just so common. And the way that that infrastructural breakdown, the lack of funding, um, growing in like wealth inequality in the United States has doesn't just affect money, but it affects how people can relate to each other, how people can actually think creatively about making work. Benedict, thank you so much. And um, I thought that was a, a great set of ideas about 2008 and the inheritance. And we also should be remindful that not all struggles map onto other generations. So I hope we can continue to tease out um, historical evidence that certain generations lose the inheritance that other generations had. Is there a dance mobile in the present? Is there some engine of support, literally, that's driving artists to get their life in New York since the dance mobile is no longer? Karen, can we hear from you on this topic? I really enjoyed hearing your responses to this and um, as sort of the third person responding here, I think I'm, I'm also want to kind of build on what you are saying too, but uh, yeah, this idea of, you know, the support breakdown and there's so many different levels to it and it can be changing every minute or every hour, you know, and just the way of what you're doing, you know, the idea of support or inf the infrastructure. And uh, first of all, there's, you know, the personal infrastructure. You have to really kind of like, what is your own personal capacity of what you can, can be handling? Um, even in the way, uh, Benedict, if, if it's all right, if I can, when I'm hearing what you're saying and kind of responding, think about it, but just how one in their own life and what they're handling, how they, what, what's their own infrastructure. And I've experienced experienced that. And so I really appreciated hearing about that. And it brought me though, and thinking about the bartender, I don't know where you bartend, but for me that that was a very powerful place when I uh, was a bartender in, um, and I said performing there too, because bartending, it becomes that way too, but dancing, the idea of the dance within the nightclub and coming more from a performance uh, background as well. There wasn't for me, you know, institutions um, were not really supporting. It wasn't even a genre so much. So working out of the system, but I did find a great deal of support within the dance community within the nightclub. And I liked working outside for me of my art form was to work out of kind of the both that if certain institutions weren't supporting the work, working outside, but I thought that for me, the museum or the dance floor was the, was the actual dance floor within the nightclub. So I wanted to bring that up and the support of, of, of that community. Um, and I still get a great deal of support from that community because after when I lost my funding, it's really liquor that has been um, the support of that, of when I do shows many times, will have to be um, at the Beekman Theater or places like that, that's what I have to take. into. So I've had to change my work in order for that. I think I'll just leave uh, that, but um, thank you. Thank you, all three. There's um, there's histories here that these three comments are, are reminding me of. I mean, the main one to talk about the big breakdown in 1996 and the loss of direct federal su support for concert dance touring was such a huge economic shift in the dance field that I think my generation and others inherited this erosion that Benedict is mentioning of the company model of, of support. And then my question, I just a follow up question, if the generations that followed 1996 could no longer depend on federal subsidies to presenters to present dance you know, one third of the actual cost, that's what the NEA was doing for 30 years. 
And that went away in 1996, or it shrunk and went to the NIFA Foundation in 1996. So what do these breakdowns break open? What do they enable and make possible? And I'm thinking in a, in a positive light um, that the, that breakdown broke open the number of contexts where people were beginning to recognize that dance was already always thriving differently and elsewhere, right? So do we have anything else to say about the sort of um, questions that we get in the COVID moment, whether COVID created the crises that artists are inheriting or whether COVID is just exposing some of the systems that have tried to hang on despite um, economic, robust economic investment. So I'm kind of skipping to our fourth uh, question here, but it makes me think about when, when there's this kind of crisis call um, where each of you might stand on when breakdowns happen, what are they breaking open? Is that too abstract a question? Anyone have a follow-up? Carl, please. Yeah. Um, just briefly, I think it's the latter question that you asked, that it was um, that breakdown uh, has, has been there since the 80s, since the Reagan cutoffs and all of that. And it's taken various forms over the decades, I think. I think we have to take into consideration other factors such as I don't know, multiculturalism intertwining with progressivism and commodification and all of those sorts of uh, 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 systems that, that have in, in some ways helped uh, maintain uh, dance, especially on the level of great artists like Benedict and, 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 and Karen, uh, or I should say independent artists and also great uh, artists like uh, Benedict and, and, and Karen, who in, in some ways, the, this uh, intertextuality has helped them uh, go along, even as some things have been shifted more to the STEM uh, emphases, uh, the, the math and the science and all of that sort of stuff that started happening after the, uh, uh, the, the mid to late, uh, late 1990s. So uh, I would go with the fact that, uh, to finish that answer, my answer, I would go with the fact that I think COVID has exacerbated in it and revealed it, you know, the, 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 the weaknesses or the disjunctures that have already existed made it worse. And we can talk about later how much worse that it has made because, oh my God, I mean, it's still very frightening the effect that COVID has had on us, but those systems have been there and the weaknesses in those systems have been there. They just kind of shift around and play around uh, with us uh, as we go along. Thank you, Carl. Benedict or Karen, anything to add? Benedict here. Yeah, absolutely. I would feel like to echo Carl um, what has been exacerbated, like, I, I, I don't think I've said this yet, but obviously I don't speak for all millennials in case anyone was ever under the presumption that I was trying to, <laughs> just acknowledging my generational position here. But um, I feel like within the arts ecology, one of the things that the pandemic has exacerbated have been those barriers to entry, people's tolerance for risk, um, whether like, the physical health risks of presenting work in person as the different stages of the pandemic have progressed or the economic risks of, you know, committing investment to taking class, committing investment to renting rehearsal space, to, you know, self-producing shows as early emerging artists often are kind of um, tasked with fronting those costs before building that institutional, those institutional relationships, the credibility, the trust that result in a commission of some kind. And yeah, I feel like I've heard of folks leaving the fields um, at, uh, at different ages, folks who were about to enter the field and never did. Um, and in terms of of how, um, 
how all of the um, societal upheavals, the rebellions and protests of 2020, and how very real conversations about systemic racism that are not new, but are just happening again, happening on deeper levels. Um, the way that, you know, the internet economy works has served to co-opt um, the substance of these movements into slogans, into um, taglines to sell product, to sell people. And artists have, you know, the shift of the, the economy towards um, online spaces has only exacerbated like that individualistic approach to being an artist where an artist is a brand, an artist is making internet content, um, not to delegitimize internet content, but the necessity of artists in our field who have worked in live performance having to adapt to virtual presentations um, is a, a whole nother set of barriers to entry. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Benedict. Karen. Thank you for your thoughtful reflections. I'd like to build on on the comments that uh, the Carl first started, and, and 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 I want to say about these events, you know, ex exasperating um, to now. And what I would like to follow up with with is that after uh, some of the results that we're seeing, um, thinking po uh, seen since the NEA and the culture wars at that time, and that funding shifted from a, a federal model for support. And of course, we're very lucky for those of us in New York that you, there is more funding for, for the arts here. But because of that, what happened is that when there is uh, the NEA federal support, they were an agency that would go through and verify whether an institution was worthy. So they would go, uh, and, and that takes a great deal of resources so that if you are a corporation that you, you know, that you aren't having to uh, American Express or something like that, having to go through and verify all the artists. And the, so that would beca became this way of a marker uh, if you had received it, an NEA grant. So that doesn't exist anymore. It, it, like when you were saying that, uh, Benedict, that entry point isn't that way to emerge into. Um, so it's very, very difficult. And also for institutions now, they have to rely more on corporations and also in terms of, if you want to say, uh, that we're seeing so many difficulties with on the boards, such as with MoMA, right? Whitney, what has been going on? And also even uh, board members, but MoMA, where they had to get their um, their money from. And that, is, that has been sort of forced in, that has not talk, been talked about before, that uh, are oligarchs now for, for this week. And so that, there is a relationship to that, to that time and the funding and the funding um, uh, deals that have had, that are occurring now, um, whether it's going to be the marketplace for uh, within museums, um, laundering, or just uh, shady or sinister characters and families too, right? Thank you, Karen. Yes, the um, question of um, institutional support and where are artists seeking support and what are our politics, artists' politics of belonging to uh, institutional systems, I think is a very urgent one now. And I think that just to keep the conversation moving toward this question of assimilation, which I think is a little bit operating right now, like when artists are see economic incentives, whether it's a funding body or a corporate sponsorship or a the promise of you know recruiting TikTok followers and monetizing an internet site, 
um, there are these economic incentives that artists confront. It's kind of inescapable, right? So um, whereas in the 1980s and 90s, um, artists of color were really seeing an uptick in, in institutions promoting multiculturalism, promoting and recruiting and rewarding artists for organizing around this kind of flattening of cultural difference and specificity as a project. I'd love to hear you weigh in on whether and how uh, wealth holders, I'll say it broadly, whoever's holding resources are recruiting and rewarding dance makers for reproducing certain ideals. Um, I hear Benedict talk about possibly that diversity, equity, and inclusion is its own market, is its own sort of industry now that is something that artists can be suspicious of in addition to wanting to see resource redistribution and reparations happen. So what do we, what do we think about um, how wealth holders are recruiting artists it, today or in generations in the past? This is sort of the extension of the multiculturalist side of the culture war question. I don't know, Carl, you keep mentioning it, so I feel like I should start with you <laughs> so you get to say what you wanted to start with. <laughs> uh, well, this time a little, uh, I, maybe a little bit difficult for me to answer the question directly. Uh, principally because um, I've never really been involved in the in the day to day or the ins and outs of the administration on on an, on that level. Um, but if uh, if I catch your hook and try to connect it to the idea of multiculturalism, um, yeah, as I, I think I mentioned a little earlier, there was this one side where multiculturalism kind of helped spur, and I think you mentioned it too, helped spur uh, the proliferation of, of, of a kind of, of uh, a pluralistic and inclusive um, uh, uh, dance presentation and practice, all which was good, but it also put a lot of people in competition with each other. And then there was the question of, and let's uh, even to make it a little more specific, uh, were you doing black dance, for example, or not doing black dance, or, or even if, the, if your work was post-black or whatever. Um, I'm just giving these as examples of, uh, to tie in with your, your idea of assimilation and how you dealt with the, the available, um, uh, structures that that existed from like late 90s, uh, 1990s into the 2000s, and which still obviously exists in, in, in different ways. So that's how I'm thinking about that. Uh, coming from how you just asked the question just now, which I'm sure you're going to ask in a different way later, and I'll be able to answer later in a different way. But that's how I'm, I'm, I, I'm feeling it now. I'm thinking... Yeah, there are examples, there are examples like, uh, I don't know, Ilio Palmieri again, having to uh, prove that he wasn't just the angry black male, uh, the black uh, choreographer. Uh, so he created Handel uh, the, or, or Serendipity uh, that was based on Bach music and, and things like that. So those things do go on, even though as we said, um, there were also structures that helped uh, the multiplicity and the diversity uh, in dance. How I'm actually, one of the things that fascinate, fascinated me about this, um, this panel is to hear from the, uh, from the other panelists how they see that having developed how, and how, do, how is it now? How, how is it working now in terms of who gets what, how, and, and, and how that connects to uh, your meaning making in dance. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Yes, I think that we're talking about the contingencies, right? Like what, what, what it costs to belong yeah. in yes. a certain moment. What are, what are yes. the trade-offs, the costs and, and benefits of seeking and securing support on these terms? Yes. Does anyone want to jump in, Benedict or Karen? Sure. Uh, uh, Benedict here. 
in my own um, work as a performer, I've um, been cast a few times as the token trans dancer in a project and have entered those processes with that awareness and trepidation, even if um, choreographer never, you know, would never have admitted that openly from the get-go. Um, and in thinking about um, like more broadly trends about artists who get supported and how um, I think a lot about respectability, about legibility, about the um, the difference between like equitable redistribution of resources and tokenizing folks of marginalized backgrounds. To put it another way, like, you know, I'm trans, I'm Vietnamese. If I were to make a performance project that aestheticized those, um, you know, experiences into really legible, reductive narratives, whether based on, you know, trauma from the war or, you know, transition as a process and like sold that trauma, like, yeah, I think, I think presenters, I think the field, I think residency places, granting bodies would eat that, eat that nonsense up. Um, and not that there's, um, I, I, I think there's a power in wanting to explore facets of one's identity and culture authentically in a creative process and share that publicly. But oftentimes it feels like for folks of marginalized backgrounds, that can be like the only viable way forward because otherwise work isn't legible. And if work is not legible, it's not fundable. Thank you. Thank you so much for pointing to the example of all of the hidden labor that's racialized and gendered underneath invitations to belong on certain terms. So we talk about uncompensated labor in dance all the time, but the layers of uncompensated labor for marginalized groups or historically under resourced groups, um, I think is what you're amplifying here. And I really appreciate that so much. Karen, did you want to add in, chime in? I just appreciated hearing uh, these comments and refl uh, reflections. And I'm just very moved in thinking about, you know, the packaging and the erasure that goes on in terms of you know, assimilation and, and the commercial and the pressure um, and the emotional toll of, of, of having to package oneself for a certain, certain criteria in order to become a product to a certain um, women. So that is what I'm just acknowledging and recognizing. And Carl, see yeah um i just wanted to comment i really think i i really want to thank benedict for his uh response to the question uh he really made me think about some of the things that i i have to think about as a scholar of my back pronouns then. are they them carl huh i'm sorry my pronouns are they them thank you i'm sorry uh what they made me think about um uh, because I wanted to contrast a little bit, bit with what they said, uh, what Benedict said, in that it's, it, his perspective on portraying his background, the drama of his background and everything, um, can for him, for, for them, uh, get to be a, a, a kind of, uh, categorizing or, or stereotyping. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using words that I remember, not necessarily what Benedict said. But for the contrast for me in my thinking is that, yes, I understand that. But also the, for many Black dancers, this, the project is still affirming self and that experience. And 
very often now the attitude is that I don't care whether you think it's <laughs> it's dramatizing or 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 reductive or whatever. It's like that project still needs to go on because certain things still haven't been understood or said. So I just wanted to um, interact with uh, Benedict on, on that uh, particular. Not that I'm saying that he was saying that, but that's what he made of uh, what uh, Benedict made me think about. This is Sarah. Thank you, Carl. And I think in our in our last you know two minutes here, this is the beginning of the work that I think we were called to think together about the dissonance and the disagreement with respect to generation, race, background, experience that um, these kinds of events throughout this weekend will continue to surface. And it's the work to build understanding across and build coalition across. So I, I wanted to end on just this question of gestures of repair, gestures of support to, to cite Karen at the beginning. Um, I'd love to hear any fleeting thoughts you have, an example from your history or from today where artists were confronting some of these issues and gaining traction actually um, toward increasing resourcing or care or support um, I see a huge uptick in arts labor activism in the current generation, people making demands and, and putting exploitative circumstances on blast. Um, can each of you think to one of these examples where artists are making demands in a fruitful way to uh, take us out? I'm not going first on this one. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm just going to say that um, I, joy, a finding joy still, and it, um, I'm answering it not in this particular way that you're asking, but for I, I'm, I'm thinking about really the the joy of 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 creating and making work, and I see that in so many artists. And I also like the idea of seeing about with artist labor, asking for um, pay and reasonable pay for what you do, that what we do is labor and that we are professionals and to be expecting payment for it. And that's what I'm very, very excited to be seeing. And I hope that changes for the better. Thank you, Karen. Anyone want to take a stab? I'm personally thinking of the amount of digital content that Benedict was pointing to earlier and the kinds of copyright activism we see choreographers in the commercial sphere, Jacqueline Knight, you know, that are actually demanding um, copyright protections for one another. These are the kinds of things that inspire me to think that we can center uh, artists' work uh, in a public forum. Um, Benedict or Carl, did you want to add anything on our way out? I will. Um, uh, go ahead. I, I, just to uh, address the question obliquely, I, uh, I guess, and in, in also in prep, uh, preparing for this uh, this conversation. Um, I was uh, made aware of Miguel Gutierrez's article on uh, the, the grant you wish you could write, which I found extraordinarily powerful on the level, on, as a personal testimony on how he, the whole process of him having to uh, maintain his footing as a creative artist and maintain dancers who are going to work with him, but also having to do the administrative work of applying for the grants. And uh, the value that I found in the piece, the, the article, is his personal, um, is, is the personal uh, challenge that he goes through, the mental challenge that he goes through. And it also kind of connects with uh, what people are going through today with COVID, uh, uh, trying to come out of the COVID pandemic. And uh, I, uh, I'm also, I, I have friends and, and uh, or, or people, I know of people who 
uh, who have studios who are, you know, they've barely hung on at this time, uh, up until this moment, and they still may have to close their studios or, you know, or, or their dance companies. Um, so that doesn't quite answer your question, but it's, uh, that's what I'm thinking about what's happening today. And I'm very concerned about it. Thank you, Carl. Benedict, I'm kicking it over there. That's the last Yeah, one. I will um, receive the sports object or baton or what have you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, kind of responding to Carl's previous thought about like, you know, and that thread that we were having earlier, um, I, yeah, I feel like I want to clarify and acknowledge the difference between like folks making whatever work that they want versus folks from marginalized backgrounds being pressured, incentivized to make certain kinds of work because of certain cultural backgrounds. And something that I've been thinking about with peers um, over the last couple of years have been modes to refuse those expectations and explore um, where uh, other models, other ways of engaging wealth holders um, is possible. I'm so inspired that you took us there, Benedict, at the end. This is Sarah. And I think, um, right. So sometimes I think about artists as their own best patrons to a certain extent, this idea of um, collective energy around reorganization, distributed leadership, these kinds of strategies um, seem to be giving folks life right now. And I do want us to remember the themes of care and uh, mutual support that are undergirding this event. And rather than leave on a gloom and doom <laughs> note that there's an economic crisis, which we know there is, I think there's really energy around this galvanization of this call for anti-models of support, not, not known models, but, but alternatives, alternative uh, collectivities such that Benedict is pointing us to at the end and that everyone has surfaced in their own experience. So I am getting the call that I'm going to kick it back to the organizers, except to just express my deep respect and gratitude um, to Benedict, Carl, and Karen, and thank you to our interpreters, anyone who has to keep up with my fast talking, I just have utmost respect for. So labor, laboring with you has been a joy and um, much wealth to you in, in the most capacious definition of the term going forward. Thank you, Sarah, for your facilitation. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Dance NYC. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here and get to know you and your practice and your work. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much for your patience <laughs> and, 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 and wonderful uh, guidance uh, throughout this conversation. What a wonderful panel. Um, our thanks to each of you for your brilliant contributions to this keynote discussion. Before we close out for the night, I want to share some housekeeping items as we prepare for tomorrow's activities. I'd like to guide us briefly through what you can expect. Tomorrow, we're back here bright and early with the welcome and warm up led by Hussein Smoko at 9.45 a.m. Eastern time. Our morning sessions run from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m followed by a dance break led by, Kumbe Center for, <clears throat> led by Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance. Early afternoon sessions run from 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m., followed by lunch at our first virtual expo showcase. After that, late afternoon sessions run from 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., followed by a daily debrief led by the brilliant Maria Bauman. Last, but certainly not let, but certainly not least, Tomorrow evening, we'll host the keynote address entitled Disabled Artists and a History of Dance, Activism, and Collective Care with Corbett O'Toole. The address will be followed by a response session with disability dance artistry res residents, Allison Kopit, Anna Gishan, and X, 
and moderated by Laurel Lawson, choreographer and artist engineer, Rose Tree Productions. Again, please remember to tag us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and use the hashtag DanceSimp. Lastly, we hope you can join us next for our virtual opening night dance party, featuring music by Frank Malloy IV, aka DJ Olobe. Have a great evening. Thank you for joining today's session. A special thanks to our funders, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York State Council on the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Arts. A special thanks to our lead corporate sponsor, Con Edison, and our lead dance advocate, Jody Gottfried Arnold. Subsidies for the Education and Dance Worker Ticket Tiers are made possible by the Arnold Foundation. A special thanks to our leader, host, and partner level sponsors, 92nd Street Y, Harkness Dance Center, Dance Education Library, Cataliote Law, Full Out Creative, Gibney Dance Center, Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance, The Actors Fund, Ballet Hispanico, Fit for Dance, Nai Ni Chin Dance Company, NDI Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, New York Live Arts, and Tom O'Connor Consulting Group. And last, but certainly not least, a special thanks to our Justice, Equity, and Inclusion Partners, Art Beyond Sight, Art Space Sanctuary, Asian American Arts Alliance, Center for Traditional Music and Dance, the International Association of Blacks in Dance, Lotus Music and Dance, Museum Arts and Culture Access Consortium, National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, New York Foundation for the Arts, and Women of Color in the Arts. Tomorrow we start bright and early with a welcome and warm up at 9.45 a.m., followed by a full day of sessions. At 10 a.m., we begin with three simultaneous gatherings, followed by a dance break led by Kumbe Center for African and Diaspora Dance. At 12 p.m., we enjoy three more sessions for our early afternoon segment, followed by lunch, at which time you can visit our exhibitor hall for some virtual expo showcases by our incredible sponsors. At 2.30 p.m., we present three more late afternoon sessions, followed by a daily debrief where the community can gather and digest all the information and insight of the day in one space. Lastly, we meet at the keynote address from 6 to 8 p.m. Stay connected with us by posting your takeaways on social media using the hashtags DanceSimp, DanceNYC 2022, and DanceSimp 2022. On Instagram at dance.nyc, on Twitter at dance.nyc, and on Facebook at dance slash nyc. Some features not to miss. Build your agenda of sessions, connect with other attendees, join community conversations, visit the exhibitor hall. Don't forget to check out the 2022 Symposium Digital Program Book. How are we doing? Did you like a session? Use the like feature on your favorite session. Got feedback for us? Take the post-event survey after March 19th and tell us how we did. Need help? Email us at customerservice at dance.nyc. A special thanks to our broadcast streaming partners at Full Out Creative. Thanks for joining. Keep in touch at dance.nyc.